Welcome to the St Melitis Organ Restoration Project's pod tour. This tour is designed to be taken on location as a guided walk. If you're listening at home or on the computer, it should work as a documentary in its own right. So sit back and enjoy. If you're walking with us, take yourself to St Melitis Church on the corner of Tollington Park and Evershot Road and join Una Gay and Susan Hahn from Islington Guided Walks who are waiting to tell you all about the diverse and eclectic musical history of Stroud Green. Hello, I'm Una. And I'm Susan. And welcome to our St Melitis Organ Project podcast. The musical heritage of Stroud Green and Finsbury Park is amazing and we are really lucky to have so many reminders of this fantastic past. Join us today as we show you how to find these memories as you stroll around M4. How does this church behind us, St Melitus, fit into this? Well, at the moment there's funding from the National Lottery Heritage Fund to restore the wonderful Hunter organ installed in the church in 1920. At the time, the building was owned by New Court Congregationalists who wanted to recognise the sacrifices made by 221 soldiers of the First World War, of whom 46 sadly died. So the organ was used regularly in church services but needed some urgent conservation work to save it. By the way, Alfred Hunter and Son of Clapham were known for their smooth tonal design This firm was eventually bought by Henry Willis and Sons, the most famous organ builders of all. The church and the organ underwent significant changes when the Catholic parish of St Melitus bought the building in 1959. This was to serve the rapidly increasing number of parishioners, which followed a wave of Irish immigration after World War II. The two tablets attached to the organ listing the soldiers' names were feared lost some years ago but were rediscovered and happily reinstalled in 2014. Now, we're really keen to celebrate on this tour how Stroud Green has changed over the last century, but still with music at its core. On this tour, we'll explore a variety of sound from pianos, cinema organs, folk music, as well as from recording studios and concerts held, of course, at Finsbury Park and the amazing Rainbow Theatre down on Seven Sisters Road. Now, we're going to cross Tollington Park at the traffic lights and walk to number 106 Tollington Park, where there's a really interesting piece of modern recording history. So, we're standing in front of a building and on the side you can see what was probably a stables or coach house. And it was here that some of the major recordings were made in the 1970s. There were many such small recording studios across North London at the time, including Wessex Sound Studios and Highbury New Park, where The Clash and The Sex Pistols made recordings, and Conk Studios in Hornsey, created by local Muswell Hill band The Kinks. Park Chapel on Crouch Hill is used by church studios now, made famous by the Eurythmics, again a local duo, and where Bob Dylan made a legendary visit, mixing up Crouch End Hill with Crouch Hill and allegedly sitting down to tea with Dave the Electrician instead of Dave Stewart of the Eurythmics. So in this Victorian villa, there was a recording studio used by Decker, and it was known as Decca 4 from 1972 to 1979. Here it was that Thin Lizzy and Moody Blues, amongst others, made recordings. Swedish brothers Hans and Anders Nordmark reopened the studio as jam studios in 1979, and it was here that the Smiths, New Order and Spandau Ballet made recordings. It closed at the end of the 1980s, sadly. Now we're going to go back to the Pelican Crossing, cross back over Tollington Park and walk towards the junction with Stroud Green Road to number 89 Stroud Green Road, the site of Ellison Company Piano Makers Workshop. Okay, so now we've crossed Stroud Green Road and we're standing at the corner with Upper Tollington Park, looking back across the road at 89 Stroud Green Road, where Ellis & Co had a piano factory. 
If you lived in Finsbury Park 120 years ago, pianos would have been a major part of your soundscape. Remember, radio had barely been invented. Piano playing expanded greatly from the mid-19th century onwards, as the upright piano with an iron frame became more affordable. You bought a piano when you got married and had your own house or your own rooms. My grandmother polished hers proudly each week while never learning more than a few simple tunes on it. And as you walk around Finsby Park, you can find two or three examples of surviving buildings that were factories. There's one at 100 Blackstock Road, at 7 Gillespie Road, and another at 45 Monsell Road. A piano is complicated. It has about 5,000 moving parts. So to make it needs careful, trained workers, and there's a strong family element in its manufacture. We can use trade directories to find a cluster of piano makers here around Finsbury Park as the industry moved north from Camden Town. And apprentices in the art could take four-year technical training at the local Northern Polytechnic on Holloway Road, now London Metropolitan University. Piano firms were important employers locally and business leaders in the community. We've even uncovered in a local newspaper a fundraising concert held on the 7th of May 1912 for survivors of the Titanic, where the piano was provided by Ellison Co, whose workshop space you're looking at. Sadly, those premises were destroyed in the Second World War and this corner rebuilt. By the beginning of the 20th century, it was the Germans who dominated the piano market. The country exported 65 times as many as the UK by 1912. But the First World War changed all this. There were waves of really strong anti-German feeling. Even the royal family had to change their name from saxe coburg gotha to Windsor. The Beckstein Hall off Oxford Street, showcasing this famous German brand, had to be sold to Debenhams in 1916 and was renamed Wigmore Hall in 1917. Piano making continued into the 40s around Finsbury Park and we found seven companies listed in 1939. Bombing destroyed much of Stroud Green and then industry moved out to purpose-built premises Gradually, cinema and television killed off the tradition of the family piano. Now we're going to cross Upper Tollington Park at the traffic lights and walk south towards Finsbury Park. We're going to stop outside New Beacon Books at number 76 Stroud Green Road. So now we're standing outside New Beacon Books at number 76 Stroud Green Road. Many migrant communities found their home in this area after World War II. From being a predominantly Irish area, increasing numbers of African-Caribbean migrants settled here in the 1940s and 50s. And as time went on, Greek and then later Turkish Cypriots became established here, developing the rag trade centred on Font Hill Road. As the Cypriot populations began to move on, Turkish and Kurdish communities made the area their home, particularly to the north in neighbouring Green Lanes. In the 80s and 90s, Somali refugees began to settle, often south of Seven Sisters. On this walk, we'll look at three main groups of migrants. There are many others. London has over 240 nationalities at last count. The boroughs of Haringey and Islington are among the most diverse. Over 180 languages spoken in Haringey. Andrea Levy's novel Small Island gives a vivid picture of migrant African-Caribbean life in the 1950s, facing desperate discrimination at work and in housing. The novel ends with Hortense and Gilbert buying a house in Finsbury Park, at the time an area where housing was very cheap, especially as much of the place was covered in rubble from bomb sites. The photographer Don Cullen, who grew up in Font Hill Road, took some vivid photographs of the half-ruined houses inhabited there. Andrea grew up just south of Finsbury Park in an Islington council estate, Twyford House, on Elwood Street, where there's now a plaque recognising her literary legacy. Trinidadian John LaRose was a long-term resident of Stroud Green Road and his legacy lives on here at New Beacon Bookshop, founded in 1966. 
It was the first Caribbean publishing house, bookshop and international book service. John died in 2006, but the George Padmore Institute continues his work. John and his wife, Sarah White, were involved in the black education movement from the 60s, and Sarah has agreed to speak with us today. Well, I met John back in 1965. We were involved with developing New Beacon Books, first as a publisher, and he really felt it was important for different generations to know about their past. And to be able to do that and have control over doing that, it meant you had to be in a position to publish. It's always been a very small publisher because it hasn't had that much money, nor that much time, because uh, really John got, you could say, distracted along the way with various campaigns. The George Padmore Institute naturally grew out of this campaigning activity because what the George Padmore Institute contains are the archives from all these different campaigns that went on from the Caribbean artist movement through the black education movement, the black parents movement, the New Cross massacre. So it, it's, it's a treasure trove of one particular aspect of post-war black activity. Tell us about your musical memories of Stroud Green. What, what stands out for you over the years that you've lived here? The main thing that probably stands out, because I was very much involved in it, was the Notting Hill Carnival Bands. John's two older sons, they had a, a sound, what was called a sound system, had these enormous great speakers and things. I mean, it's nothing like these very neat little stuff that people have now. And they used to be staggering around the place with these. So they were part of the club scene for West Indians. Their sound system was called People's War. The second son, Keith, also had a record store down on Seven Sisters Road. The carnival bands, they were communal activities, people working together to produce the costumes, and all of that involved with the music of the carnival of that year. This building here, the top floor, I remember at one point we were using as a carnival band sewing room, and things like that. That was the carnival, the mass campus, they called it, where, where it was put together. There was a point when you had the static sound systems and the moving bands. So in a way, sort of Jamaican music and the Trinidadian music. I personally, I haven't been for some time because I just found it got too, too crowded and I couldn't make it, but that's, that's just me. <laughs> We're going to continue down Stroud Green Road to number 48, Pax Hair Products. We've made it down to the distinctive green shop front of Pax Hair and Beauty Products, which dominate this part of Stroud Green Road. But here is one of the most intriguing musical memories in the area. Did you know that the oldest independent record label in the world used to have studios here? And it's now 81 years old, Topic Records. Its location in Stroud Green fits into our suburb's long association with radical thought and action. Newcourt itself was a radical reaction to the established Church of England back in the 1660s when it was founded. But more recently, Stroud Green housed the first secretary of the Communist Party of Great Britain, Albert Inkpin, a conscientious objector and a pacifist. And we've just seen how the African-Caribbean community moving into Stroud Green challenged the establishment. Topic Records, in fact, began as the recording wing of the Workers' Music Association, an educational offshoot of the Communist Party of Great Britain. Founded by music professor and composer Alan Bush with support from Benjamin Britten and Paul Robeson, its original 1939 brief was to release gramophone records of historical and social interest. Its first release was a recording of the Internationale. Paul Robeson's message of peace was recorded at the 20th anniversary of the communist newspaper, The Daily Worker, which was held at Haringey Arena on nearby Green Lanes in February 1950. Its communist associations are long gone, but Topic was revitalised with the British folk renaissance from the late 1950s, with Ewan McColl and later Martin and his daughter Eliza Carthy, who both recorded with Topic. 
Run on a shoestring, it survived some difficult days with the decline of vinyl. As its website states, it has withstood wars, shortages, austerity, economic disaster, the vagaries of fashion, corporate onslaught, and various cataclysmic shifts in the fortunes of the recording industry. And Topic has to have the most eclectic collection ever. Records by Paul Robeson, Vanessa Redgrave, the massed choirs of the Glasgow Socialist Singers and the Glasgow Young Communist League, and Harry H. Corbett of Steptoe and Son fame, who sang sea shanties with Ewan McColl and A.L. Lloyd on an album called The Singing Sailor. Topic is now partnered with Proper Music Group in Dartford, but as recently as the 2000s, it was based in Stroud Green. We're going to cross Stroud Green Road now, beyond the railway bridges at the traffic lights and head to the bronze statues in front of Finsbury Park Rail Station. Take note of Rowan's Bowling Club near the entrance to the park. Finsbury Park developed as a transport hub when a small station was opened here in the 1860s, just as a new public park itself was being created. So we're now in Finsbury Park bus station, the one in front of Finsbury Park Overground. And you might be able to see three statues in metal. One of them is a statue of Jazzy B. So the musical heritage of Black Britons in Finsbury Park is huge. Jazzy B, real name Trevor Beresford Romeo, was a music producer, entrepreneur, and the founding member of Soul to Soul. He stands next to two female pioneers of Islington, Edith Garrard, the suffragette, and Florence Keane, founder of Manor Gardens Health Centre in Holloway. Jazzy was born to parents of Antiguan descent in Ormond Road, Hornsey Rise, the ninth of 10 children, several of whom began to run sound systems in the late 1960s and 1970s. As a young teenager, he went skating at Ali Pali. Older brothers introduced him to a whole range of sounds and he was able to develop from his reggae heritage to a new, authentically London sound. Jazzy built his first double deck as a school project for woodwork. At Doogie's Hideaway on Junction Road, Tuffnell Park, he had his first gig in 1977, but changed his band name to Soul to Soul in 82. It was originally an umbrella name for several of his projects, including clothing and a record shop. From 1985 to 1989, Jazzy and Soul to Soul would hold what would be regarded as legendary nights at the Africa Centre in Covent Garden. Jazzy was brought up round the corner from George Power in Grenville Road. Now, George Power founded KISS FM in the 80s as a pirate radio station. Power was a Greek Cypriot and he helped Jazzy to gain success at Crackers Club in Wardour Street. And we shouldn't forget Alex Pascal, an African-Caribbean broadcaster who still lives in Crouch Hill. Alex was the first black broadcaster with a regular show, Black London, from 1974. His influence in the arts community has been huge. So we're going to cross back over Stroud Green Road and walk towards Fintry Park, past Rowan's, the former cinema and majestic ballroom, and then past the cycle lock-up into the park towards Seven Sisters Road. Let's stop on the grass and talk about Finsbury Park's Irish heritage. So we're now standing in Finsbury Park. The Irish have been present in London for centuries and Irish music has always been an important element. There were Irish centres across North London, from parish halls to professional dance halls, where traditional music could be heard and, more importantly, played. In the 50s in particular, Irish emigrants like my family headed to London to nurse, to dig the roads and to do the jobs that immigrants have always done. Finsbury Park remained an Irish area, not least due to the influx of labourers to build the Victoria Line underground in the 60s and 70s. Now, 4% of Islington population is Irish-born, but it was twice as high as that 50 years ago. 
And the majestic ballroom, now Rowan's, was an Irish dance hall in the 50s and 60s. Occasionally, it allowed in pop concerts. The Beatles played here in April 63 to an audience of 2,000. Rowan's has been a cinema in its time, and we will explore that shortly. As a generation of London-born Irish grew up, they made their own particular contribution to popular music. Johnny Rotten, for example, was born John Lydon of Irish parents in Holloway. He formed the Sex Pistols in 1975. Other London Irish groups include the Pogues with Shane McGowan. We've lost a major Irish pub in the Sir George Roby on Isledon Road opposite the Rainbow. This was the haunt of roadies from across the road at the Rainbow Theatre and also itself began doing gigs. During the late 1980s, this place was the venue for any up-and-coming band with a Ford Transit van that was on the toilet circuit up and down the country. Folk musician Joe Giltrap ran the Roby in the early 1980s and Christy Moore, the Pogues, were some of the acts that he hosted before leaving in 1987. Nick Hornby is said to have based the Harry Lauder music venue in the High Fidelity book on the Sir George Roby. Hi, I'm Jerry Caulfield. I grew up at Upper Tonton Park in the late 70s, 80s. As a um, child of Irish immigrants, the Pogues were big news in, in our kind of uh, community and in my sort of music tastes. And so when they said they were playing at the Roby, uh, we went down there. But uh, I don't recall getting any photos and my camera broke in the sort of crush and melee. I remember it was a really, really great gig. My sister Siobhan worked at the Rainbow in the evenings. She got me in to see the police in 1979 and uh, I was just delighted with that. But uh, a couple of other ones I was probably less delighted with was uh, she used to say, can you and your friends come and fill up some seats because it's not sold out and they want it to look busier. So uh, I remember Shawadi Wadi was one of them, which would do my cred no good whatsoever. <laughs> And from 1990, Finsbury Park itself became a major venue for Irish rock music, hosting the FLA. This tradition ended in 2004 with the apparent decline of Irish rock music. But bands that did play here included Van Morrison, Sinead O'Connor, The Pogues, Cause, U2, Cranberries and of course Christy Moore. Now the Wireless Festival has taken up residence since 2014 and that features more varied artists including Stormzy. We're going to leave the park now, walk through to Seven Sisters Road and stand just outside Lidl in front of the park gates. We're standing now outside Lidl on the Seven Sisters Road. There used to be several cinemas 50 metres or so from Finsbury Park Station and the cinema experience itself was a key early 20th century form of entertainment. Where Lidl is today was the Finsbury Park Cinema and Rowan's began as a roller skating ring but developed into a cinema in 1913. The most visible survival is of course the Rainbow Theatre on a road island just on Seven Sisters Road, now rescued from dereliction in the 1990s by the Brazilian Church of God, UK, a charismatic Christian denomination. But we're not going to talk about the films. Instead, we're going to focus on cinema organs, which came on the scene just about the time that the St Melitus organ was being installed in 1920. They would have formed part of the soundscape experienced by our soldier families. So why did cinema organs become so important? They were originally made for music, for silent movies in the 20s, but when the talkies came along, they took on the role of solo music instruments. Cinema goers would often find the music of the mighty Wurlitzer or Compton or Christie as exciting as the movie, and theatre organists themselves became stars. Radio and records brought the same thrilling sounds to the home, and the music of the theatre organ became part of everyday life. Theatre organs are real pipe organs, but they're much more versatile than church organs. Robert Hope Jones, the innovator who set the ball rolling at the turn of the 20th century, called them unit orchestras, instruments that really can cope with everything from the classics to the big band sound. The rich, spine-tingling sound of a mighty theatre organ is something you'll never forget. 
On a theatre organ, the part of the organ containing the keyboards, pedals, stop keys and other devices was usually connected electrically to the rest of the instrument by the main cable containing many wires. The console may be fixed or mobile on a wheeled platform or on a lift as was traditional in the 1930s cinemas. The original boxy design of consoles gave way to curves and bright colours, hence the nickname Jelly Moulds. The image of the theatre organ console rising from the depths is deeply ingrained in popular culture. In 1926, the Finsbury Park Rink Cinema, now Rowan's, replaced a 1915 Thomas Jones pipe organ with a Wurlitzer organ, only the ninth one built outside of the United States and it was a two-manual, eight-rank Model F, if you want to know. In the Second World War, sadly, the organ was dismantled and later used for parts, the cinema itself closing in 1958. But happily, a Wurlitzer installed nearby in the Palace Cinema in Tottenham survives today in Rye College, East Sussex. The Finsbury Park Astoria, now Rainbow, was not the first cinema to open in Seven Sisters Road, but it was part of the new wave of cinema experiences. The Compton organ inside was a central part of that experience, as well as a full-size orchestra. The permanent console for the organ was above the arch of the stage, and the music entered to the auditorium through three windows above that. Cinema organists had to be able to play all kinds of music, from jazz to classical to bebop taking account of the audience for individual films and shows. It is one of those professions which has simply vanished today. Most cinemas sold their organs when buildings were being multiplexed or closed. Now only a handful of organs remain in cinemas in Britain. The rest have found their way into town halls, clubs, churches, schools, museums, places of commercial entertainments and even private homes. We're going to just move shortly up the road to talk about the Cypriot experience of immigration here and we can't forget the number 29 bus. The route runs along Seven Sisters Road here to Manor House. We are standing near the 29 bus stop on Seven Sisters Road. This bus route has special symbolism for London Cypriots. Facing poverty at home, Cypriots began to emigrate to London from the 1930s. They arrived either by boat, at the peak there were three ships a week docking at Southampton, or by train via Athens. Many just knew enough English to ask for Victoria Station, and from there they could catch the number 29 bus to Camden Town. The lack of housing following the terrible bombings of the Second World War meant many Cypriots began to move north of Camden to Islington and eventually, in the early 60s, to Haringey. In 1961, half the pupils at Pools Park School in Lennox Road were of Cypriot origin. Turkish Cypriots also came to the area, but by the 1960s, Greek Cypriots outnumbered Turkish Cypriots by four to one. The Turkish invasion in 1974 changed everything for Cypriots around the world. A third of Cypriots were now refugees. Many decided to move to the UK to join family members there. By the 70s, Haringey had the highest concentration of Cypriots in the UK. Many found jobs in catering, then opened their own cafe. Alice Georgiou's parents arrived here in 1962 and she was born in Islington in the 1960s. My father had a cafe, a Greek cafe, in the 70s on Hornsey Road. We were not allowed in the evening when the men folk <laughs> came out to play their evening card games. Uh, children weren't allowed on the premises. But during the day we used to love going there and just sitting there having some tea and we'd listen to some Greek music because Dad always had the Greek music in the background. It would be just on the Saturdays where we'd be allowed to come out with Mum, walk down Sussex Way, all the way down to Seven Sisters where we'd go to the shops and we'd do our shopping. There would be quite a few Greek restaurants there 
in the evenings they would turn into nightclubs. You'd go in there, you'd have your food, and then I think about nine o'clock the music would start, and then people, while they're eating, they could get up and dance, and then go back and continue eating, and they'd play lovely Greek music, Rembetika, or um, Nishiodiga, which is the island songs. While you're dancing, the singer would sing around you and you can throw flowers at them. There'll be plates of roses or carnations and you'd throw them at the singer just to praise them for singing their song. The plate breaking has stopped, but they used to break plates. The music is played mainly with the buzuki. It's, uh, it's like a guitar, like a ding ling 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 ling. It's, um, it's a very lovely sound that the buzuki makes. As well as founding KISS FM, George Power, whom we came across earlier at Jazzy B's statue, gave voice to the Greek Cypriot music Alice remembers when he founded London Greek Radio in 1983. Born in Famagusta in 1952, George, real name Agis Araculius, came to London as a small child. London Greek Radio continues to broadcast from studios in North Finchley today. Greek Cypriots developed their own community schools to teach Greek and keep their musical heritage alive. Turkish Cypriots now predominate in Green Lanes, along with Kurdish people. They are also familiar with the number 29 bus, often moving up to Stoke Newington. Cypriot artists also performed regularly at our next stop on the tour, the Rainbow Theatre. On the 25th of June 1977, the second of two sell-out nights featured Yorgos Dolaris, Harris Alexiou, Anna Visi and Haralambos Garga Nukaris. Let's head back now along Seven Sisters Road towards Holloway, past the gates to Finsbury Park. We're going to be passing under even more railway bridges on our way to Isildon Road. We're standing at the corner of Font Hill Road with Seven Sisters Road. Diagonally across, you'll see a green and cream tiled building. That was the Rainbow Theatre, previously the Astoria Cinema, and now, of course, the UK KG Help Centre. If you look straight across the road, across Seven Sisters, you'll see a new hotel complex going up next to student accommodation. And that was the site of the Sir George Roby pub. We heard earlier how the Astoria Cinema opened here in the 1930s. The architecture was extraordinary. While the tiled entrance was imposing, the general brick exterior was quite functional. It was, however, the magnificent atmospheric interior decoration that caught the imagination of cinema goers. The illusion of being outdoors on a balmy Mediterranean night was an essential part of the design. Audiences could feel that they were seated in a Spanish Moorish courtyard and this was made complete with a ceiling of twinkling stars. Art Deco swirls and zigzag could be witnessed in the spectacular vestibule, the centrepiece being a fountain in a star-shaped pool. A similar fountain in Brixton was removed as too many cinema goers apparently fell in. Rising costs by 1939 meant that the new owners, the Odeon Group, scrapped stage shows, allowing more film shows and eventually even the organ playing during the interval was abandoned. From the early 1960s, the Astoria began to be used for concerts and it was these that drew the audiences rather than film. The rainbow excites so many memories for rock fans in the 60s and 70s. Recordings of live performances are cherished today. The rainbow was known as the Astoria until 1971 when it was rebranded exclusively for gigs. All the big name acts played here. Cat Stevens and Jimi Hendrix on together on the 31st of March 1967. This was the first time that Hendrix burnt his guitar on stage and he had to be taken to hospital with minor burns. The Hollies and the Kinks played here on the 2nd of May 1964 and Otis Redding on 17th of March 1967. Beatles hysteria broke out at the legendary Christmas show of 1964 with 20 separate performances in a fortnight. On the 22nd of March 1969, Stevie Wonder played the Astoria. 
In the 1970s, there was a mixture of established acts and then up-and-coming punk, like The Clash in 1977, but also Bob Marley. Sadly, it was new licensing requirements and extra costs that led to its closure in December 1981. Elvis Costello and the Attractions played the last concert ever performed at the theatre. So that's the end of our musical tour. We hope you have enjoyed it. Do follow St Melitis Organ on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram to continue the story.